Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a given Monday morning at 9 a.m. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And more specifically, this is Community Matters. And we're talking again about architecture because um, Kevin Newt is here and uh, he gave us a show a couple of weeks ago. And we're talking about animation in architecture. So, Kevin, welcome back to the show. It's so nice to see you yet again. Good morning, Jay. Um, uh, thanks for having me back. So, can you give us a handle on exactly what this is? Uh, can you make sure everybody understands the logic of it? Right. Um, uh, again, thanks, uh, Jay, for, for giving me this uh, second opportunity. Um, if we could bring up the, the, the first image, uh, um, I'll, I'll get straight in. So our ancestors um, 10,000 years ago would have evolved, grown up, our physiology would have evolved in this kind of environment, basically mostly outdoors, um, full of change. Um, uh, next image. And then there's been research uh, over the last decade or two indicating that uh, contact with nature and natural change in particular uh, lowers stress and improves uh, s attention. Um, uh, next image. Unfortunately, um, most people in the developed world now spend over 90% of their lives in environments not unlike this where nature and change are completely absent. Uh, next image. Um, many, many of us work or live or both I in environments where it appears that nature is, is entirely absent. Um, next image. However, um, in, in most cases, uh, the vast majority, um, the largest wilderness on the planet is only the thickness of a piece of glass away from us. Uh, and it's uh, a particular piece of nature that is characterized by constant change. Next. Um, there's one fly in the ointment here um, that buildings are, um, we all learn in architecture school 101, meant to protect us from the weather. So how could you bring the movements of the weather indoors without actually compromising shelter? And that's been the question that I've been looking at over the last few years. Uh, next image. So uh, I've identified, um, with some help, uh, three very simple strategies for bringing natural change uh, movement into buildings without actually compromising shelter. Enclosing um, weather animated change, um, basically courtyards, um, projecting weather animated change uh, onto interior surface, that's the middle image here, and then back projection onto a translucent surface. Now all three of these images are happen to be um, leaf movement, um, but they could be um, sun, they could be um, rain. Uh, next image. Um, so that took care of, um, and there's evidence to show that it, it does reduce stress and improve uh, attention which is important when you're in uh, buildings for eight, nine hours a day and you're not free to just go take a walk. Um, so in, in essence, um, if you are free to go take a walk in nature, if there is nature around, it's not a problem, but most of us, uh, most of the working population have to be at their workplace. So trying to bring nature to them rather than insist on them going to nature because it's not practical during a weekday very often. If we could go back to that image, sorry, uh, Eric. Um, the other component of this that is that um, green buildings, uh, a large part of green building is passive environmental control where instead of HVAC you're using um, natural ventilation, um, instead of electrical lighting you're using daylighting, um, shading, um, passive solar, uh, rainwater harvesting. These are really, really important, very effective sustainable practices, but they're grossly underused compared to what they could be. And one of the reasons for that is that the general public are really not aware of them even when they are being used because they are so passive. So it turns out, if we could go to the next image, that um, the movements of the sun, the wind and the rain, the sun, wind and rain are the usual three suspects in passive environmental control for buildings, but they're also um, primary in natural um, animation of indoor spaces. So I've been looking at how to combine the two, uh, in other words, to make passive environmental controls like daylighting, shading, solar heating, etc., visible so that not only will um, building occupants be stimulated and uh, calmed by those effects, but also 
made aware of these Im increasingly important passive environmental controls. And the final slide, please. So here are uh, an array of, of some examples where um, the movement or a, a passive environmental control strategy is being made visible to building occupants. So the hope is that that will start a conversation along the lines of, well, what is that effect? And um, then the explanation will be, well, that is in order to save us money, but it will also save the planet by using less electrical power um, and therefore um, less environmental damage. So there's both a poetic, uh, a physiological, and an environmental component to this, Jay. Um, and um, that's kind of the background to what I was showing you um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'd be interested to, to hear your, your, your thoughts on that. Well, I'll give you a scenario. Uh, there you are in, in the downtown. You're in a big conference room. There's a developer, and next to him, a banker. And they say, Kevin, pitch me. <clears throat> I'm going to develop this big project. It's going to be 500 residential units. Uh, how does this play into my project? What a great scenario. Do you actually know any of those people that you could introduce? <laughs> um, you may uh, not want to meet them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, um, I, at the heart of even the toughest banker, there's a human being and, and, and a child, actually, you know, inside of all of us. I said it recently to my own students that many of these environmental experiences with nature, we've already had before, we're, before the age of five. So it really, they're core kinds of experiences that, um, that resonate across cultures. I could show this to somebody from Japan or from Germany or anywhere else and they would recognize. So it's kind of universal. But back to your scenario, Jay, um, these are things that will help improve, um, reduce stress. Well, stress is a killer. Uh, you know, chronic stress. If you're in an environment long enough, working or living, where you're constantly stressed, it has long-term detrimental effects on your physical health, um, as well as your mood, of course. Um, and um, so the idea that you could live in an environment, you know, 30 stories off the ground, and yet still be connected with nature, be calmed by nature, not what happens when you can't go for those long hikes? You know, eventually, if we lo live long enough, all of us uh, will become a member of that group of people we commonly call the disabled, where we can't walk a long way. Um, so what happens then? Well, if you could stay in an apartment and still feel that you were in contact with nature and natural change, you know, even on the 33rd floor, then um, I believe that that would be an important you know, factor in somebody purchasing and saying, hey, you know, it's going to cost me, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars more, but this environment is entirely different from the one next door where those spaces are static and there's no nature in them. So I think it's, um, you know, what is, wor what is contact with nature worth? I think I can't put a dollar value on it, but um, what is an extra uh, higher quality standard of living going to be worth to somebody? That would be kind of the approach I might take, Jay. Great question, though. Well, on the 33rd floor, I can't go for a long walk. Uh, so we, we cannot include that, not unless we have a treadmill of some kind <laughs> built into the system. <clears throat> but what about all the other things? Can you drill down for a moment and tell us what this apartment on the 33rd floor is going to look like with mm -hmm. the animation? Well, um, there, uh, on the 33rd floor, we're not going to have any uh, growing trees unless you've got a lanai. Uh, you could, uh, you could definitely, um, you know, use the wind effects on on the lanai. Uh, there's a there's a video um, that I'm anxious to show you in a moment that actually shows some of these animations. We showed it a little bit um, a couple of weeks ago, but it was uh, much too low a resolution to really show on TV. So this one hopefully will will look a little better, but. Um, Back to the 33rd floor then, up there you're not going to, you're way above the, the treetops of course, but um, you can, and we've done it on, um, in simulation at least, you can have artificial plants in the sense of something that moves close to the movement of leaves. You can also use screens so that, um, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment, um, the air movement immediately outside your windows on the 33rd floor then, could actually tell you, uh, or the screens could actually tell you about 
the speed of that air movement, which is hard to tell if you've got hermetically sealed windows, um, which they very often are for safety reasons. Um, um, the rain, likewise, um, uh, a small amount of water on a, on a surface can reveal um, not only wind movement, but also um, uh, the slightest amount of rain. So at a push, you can do this actually directly, retrofit onto windows. Um, better if you've got a slight uh, small lanai, but both would be possible. On an office building, for example, they often don't have a lanai, so it would be necessary to um, retrofit onto the actual um, window. Let's take a short break, Kevin. Sure. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii Community Matters uh, with Kevin Nuke. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back. We're live with Kevin Newt of the UH uh, School of Architecture in Manoa. And we're talking about um, animation in, in your living quarters on the 33rd floor of a big condo and trying to examine how that's done. And Kevin, you mentioned you had a video that might help us understand what this all means. I hope so, yeah. If we could run that, then we can, uh, I can talk over it and you can uh, ask me about it. So this is a book that came out a couple of years ago. Um, here are those um, animated versions uh, of what I showed you earlier. These are all happen to be leaf movement, but you get direct enclosure of the actual foliage, you get um, projection, and you get back projection. So if you can imagine anything growing or even an artificial plant on a lanai, here's some more examples. These are all being projected on directly onto interior surface or back projected onto interior translucent surfaces. So even on the 33rd floor, if you've got a small surface of water, for example, you can bring wind-generated um, movement, these are examples, into your living quarters. These are all simply the wind affecting surfaces of water. Uh, the one on the right is back projected onto a translucent um, piece of glass. So you can get a, a large variety of natural animation that appears to be actually in the space with you. This is somewhat more exotic where we've got water on a glass roof, something that not all of us are going to be able to do. But um, these are caustics that are being, uh, these uh, patterns are known as caustics being projected. And then finally, rainfall, um, any sloping glazed surface, uh, or certainly uh, in the middle there, a horizontal one, will indicate rain. And these are examples where rain is falling onto a small surface of water outside, but it's being projected by artificial light into um, or onto interior surfaces. So and here's the last part where I was looking at the overlap of those natural indoor animations with um, sustainable practices. I hope this is going to advance. One second. I might need to. Oh, here we go. All right. So here's that same argument then, that green buildings really don't tell us anything about why they got their gold stars. And I'm arguing that buildings should be able to talk for themselves and ex show building occupants just what they're doing uh, to earn those um, sustainable credentials. I wonder if this is okay, going to Okay, uh, that could be the end of it. Yeah, um, we're back. All right, so um, that's really the, um, the, the theory and the, and the uh, there's an experimental component behind this, um, Jay, where we've sat people in basement rooms and um, mimicked or, or simulated wind movement and sun movement and we've done the heart rate um, experiments and uh, uh, attentional experiments and there are s significant um, improvements in both um, lowered heart rate and improved attention um, when people are in those naturally animated environments compared to 
a normal static indoor environment. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of hopeful that um, that this is going to pick up. Well, I just uh, just a reaction on it is that I recently saw I get where some footage um, of the, this really expensive uh, condo uh, penthouse. I think it must have been the Howard Hughes uh, uh, building there in Kakaako, mm -hmm. you know, the one that went for about a hundred million dollars. It was it's a two-story penthouse, mm -hmm. and the the ceiling of it was was all glass, and it was atop the building, and uh, it had it had these shutters that came down and closed closed the glass if you wanted, mm -hmm. um, but most of the time it was open, and the view was absolutely spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, and you could, you know, you could see and feel the elements. You could see the rain. You could see the wind. All that stuff was visible to pretty much the whole main body and on that floor, the top floor of the building. Right. I said to myself, you know, this is really the kind of thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and if the wind was blowing the rain, you could see the droplets, you know, moving around on, mm -hmm. on the glass. So it <clears throat> sounds to me like one big thing here would be glass. Uh, and I agree with you absolutely. You can't have every condo not going to have glass on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, but at least it might have as much glass as, as possible, given the, the structural considerations. Right. It, um, uh, and in this environment, and um, uh, here in, in, in Hawaii, of course, uh, uh, there are situations where you, you can actually um, go without the glass, you know, you can open up as long as there's an insect screen or something. Um, so we're very fortunate that you, you know, you can't do that in, in large parts of, of, of the world. Mm -hmm. But to be able to actually open up and feel that breeze, uh, not just see it, but it's, uh, you're absolutely right, it's when we need some kind of barrier, some kind of enclosure to keep the worst or the less comfortable parts of the weather out. But we don't want, and this is what I think, this would sum up what I think has happened over the last sort of 50 years, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, that in the process of protecting us from the weather, um, then um, architects, um, builders, engineers have uh, disconnected us from something that is actually very important for our long-term health. And I'm trying to recalibrate the envelope of buildings so that they still protect us, um, I don't enjoy you know, being soaking wet or being blown away and having all my papers blown away any more than the next person. Um, but I miss that that simulation and that contact with uh, with wild nature. And um, you know, I can uh, I could have a dog. I can bring plant plants into my apartment. I can bring fishes into my apartment, etc. Which I think is uh, I regard as a form of self medication, where buildings are not doing what we need them to do so people will kind of take up the slack themselves. The issue I have with, with those things, it, which are great, is, well, can't buildings do more? But also, domesticated nature is of a different quality. Um, when we are responsible for feeding the dog, watering the plant, etc., feeding the fishes, it's not the same. Um, it's within our control, and if we stop doing those things, that thing will die. Whereas you know, the forest, the ocean, the sky, they really are beyond our control. And we seem to need that contact with something that's much bigger than us, that finally something that we don't have control over. And that seems to be an important part of, of what we are as human beings, that sense of, um, of being some part of something much bigger. And the weather is, as I said, um, uh, the largest natural wilderness that we still have on this planet. And if you go to Mars, for example, I guess they have a form of weather, but because they don't have an atmosphere, um, you know. It's no fun at all. <laughs> well, not that I'm talking from first-hand experience, but, but, uh, but if you think about it, uh, the atmosphere, you know, the, uh, the expressions of which we call the weather, then the local expressions of which we call the weather, is, it appear, appears to be unique to our planet. So the idea of using the weather to draw attention to environmental change, um, climate change, um, it, I think is is pretty direct. You know that that if we're not careful, we'll lose that atmosphere, and once that's gone, you know that is really the key to um, all life on this earth, pretty much. Um, certainly ours. Um, so you know it may seem like it's sort of idiosyncratic and and peripheral. But I think the weather is something that is profoundly knitted in together with the human soul. You know, you can have a conversation with anybody 
anywhere in the world about what the weather's doing. You know, it seems to be a universal um, part of human being. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Hawaii would be a good place to do that. I'm, I'm wondering, though, if, um, if there's a, a model somewhere, some other country, some other city, uh, where people are already doing this that we can study and mm -hmm. maybe bring elements back and you use those elements in our design here? Well, um, I don't know that it's being done in quite the way that I'm proposing, especially with the overlap with sustainability, but uh, I first noticed this in Japan. I was in Japan for other reasons uh, um, and writing a book about um, another topic related to Japan, but always, uh, as I explained last time, always with a view to, well, what can I bring from that that would be valuable beyond Japan? Because if you're not Japanese, it's not going to be very helpful. But this was one of those elements, Jay, that um, I, uh, uh, I lived there for quite a while, and I noticed that I even in kindergarten, pre-kindergarten education, children there are sensitized to nature. It's kind of a stereotype of the Japanese, but it's very true. They, they have multiple words for all sorts of natural phenomena that w we don't even have a, a single word for. Um, and that sensitivity to natural phenomena that we would take for granted, I, I think we all seen these natural phenomena, but when they are framed by architecture and um, captured by indoor spaces, they become very special. In other words, stuff that we would see outdoors in nature and not give a second thought to, suddenly when it's in an apartment or apparently in an apartment, it becomes really special. And I think that's something that architecture has to offer. It can't compete with nature, nor should it. Um, but it can compare or frame nature and say, well, this is what human beings can do, and here's what nature can do, and isn't it amazing? Because we're clearly part of that nature. Mm -hmm. And in that way, provide a better quality of life. Right. Well, so uh, back to our scenario. Here we are with uh, the developer and the banker. <coughs> they haven't left yet, right? Oh, we haven't left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, after a while, the engineer comes in. <laughs> but here you are, the architect, mm -hmm. OK? And the developer says to you, that's very nice, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm into uh, value engineering, which means ah. I want to make it cheap and I want to sell it at the cheapest price for the mm -hmm. largest market and so mm -hmm. forth. So, um, you know, I need from you, actually, Kevin, I need a, a menu, a matrix right. of 10 things that you might suggest for these units. Right. So my question is, what, what would those 10 things be? Would mm -hmm. they be the same for every unit? Would be the same for every building? I doubt it, mm -hmm. you know, given the creative aspects of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, and then he says, this is a hard question, then he says, well, wh you know, that's a great thing. Why don't we sell the matrix? Why don't we say to these guys, if mm. they want A, B, C, and D, they mm. can buy that. It's a mm. package. Yeah. If they want E, F, and G, they can buy that, you know, separately. That's a package. Can I hire you as my commercial uh, <laughs> manager? <Jay? laughs> Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, the value engineering thing, I absolutely, you know, um, recognize. And uh, something that I'll, I, I, I I'll say to m my students a lot um, is if you've got, and um, this is a terribly badly kept secret, but if an architect has some poetic idea that they really want to introduce to a project, um, it's going to get value engineered out in the first meeting with the, with the bean counter, of course. And uh, so uh, it has to be interconnected, inextricable from other very practical things. So in this case, uh, when the accountant says, well, that's very nice, very poetic, et cetera, but um, you know, my client doesn't care whether they live long or you know, they just want the cheapest apartment, um, to be able to say, well, this will introduce natural daylight into the apartment and it, or the office, whatever it is, um, and reduce your utility bill by this percentage at the end of the, of the month, uh, the running costs. Um, of this unit will be significant less. Um, I would then turn around to the client and say, but if you want to pay more for your utility bill, by all means, fire me. Or you could fire your accountant. Why don't you choose? You know? um, but you have to, obviously, th there are several bottom lines here, environmental and, and physiological, psychological, but also financial. I, I recognize that. And that's why I've been investigating the overlap, the intersection between these passive environmental controls 
the core of which is sunlight, wind, and rain, just as it is with the natural indoor animation. So to be able to, to kind of kill both birds, I wish there was a better metaphor, um, <laughs> uh, with, with one stone, I, I should think of one, um, uh, to feed both birds with one, one cookie, whatever, um, <laughs> the, uh, is, is essentially what I'm, what I'm proposing, is to say that um, this will um, improve your life, uh, you know, might even make you live longer, certainly a, a higher quality of life, but also um, at the other end of things, in a purely pragmatic way, re reduce your utility bill, um, and by the way, help to save the planet. Uh, all of that from one thing. Again, I'll turn around to the client and say, but if you don't want any of that, you just want a cheap building, I'm not your guy. You know, keep your accountant, I'm not your guy. But I would like to think that, you know, um, huge advantages on, on the human side, um, the environmental side, and the financial side would probably appeal to the guy's, you know, um, well, um, logic, I suppose. Um, well, how about, you know, how about the banker now? Mm -hmm. The banker wants to be sure that these will sell mm -hmm. and get financed and be secured and all that, you know, and he'll get his money back. Um, but more than that, the banker wants to be sure that they'll resell right. uh, because that, you know, that maintains the value. And right. so I, the last question I put to you, we only have a minute left, is um, how would this affect the resale price of the unit to include these kinds of special amenities? Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine um, that that this, because the costs are relatively small, if you're retrofitting especially, and that's something that we've looked at. Um, I wish I'd brought the video, but we we retrofitted a light shelf. Now, a light shelf, for those who don't know, I should have brought an illustration, is something that takes light from inside a window and bounces it, reflects it back into a deep uh, uh, space because usually you get far too much light just inside a window and it, it drops off to near darkness at the back of a unit. So those are usually solid, reflective, white surfaces. What we did was to make that surface of water just outside the window so that you're actually getting animated light coming into the back of the unit. Um, so in terms of, of resale, um, I don't imagine that, that the resale value um, or appeal would be significantly different from, from the initial, you know, do you want to purchase this or not? Um, but a lot of these things are not permanent. Um, you know, you could add on um, or remove unit, uh, pieces of, of these, um, I like to call them prosthetics, architectural prosthetics, you know, that you can put onto a building um, as you wish. So if somebody said, well, I don't want that, you know, it'll be troublesome to maintain or whatever, you simply, um, you know, you get a, a guy to come in on a Saturday morning and they unscrew it and take it away. You know? um, <laughs> that's, that's what I was really getting at. Good. All right. I finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jay. Kevin Nude of the UH School of Architecture. Uh, we want to talk to you about all manner of other things going forward. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Jay, for having me back. Aloha. Bye-bye. Aloha.